Hey everyone, Johnny Boy here, and I know what you're thinking. Uh, okay, I actually don't know what you're thinking right now, but regardless of that, some of you may be wondering what exactly this video is supposed to be since I only have the name of the game in the title. Well, for those of you who don't know, I only ever put my name, Johnny Boy, after the title of a video, if it's a review, a top five, or something special like the Halloween videos I did where I talked about some indie horror games. And if you guys haven't seen those videos yet, don't. I was going through a phase at the time, and nobody should really have to witness that. But anywho, if you guys still haven't figured out what this video is supposed to be, I'll just flat out tell you. I'm doing a full review of Rune Factory 4. And I don't just mean a short 10 minute review full of jokes and parts I liked and disliked about the game, I mean a full review. Although I will try to crack the occasional joke every now and again. I will be going over the story, things I loved, liked, disliked, and downright hated about the game, as well as talk about ways I think they could have improved it. Now, if you're worried about my actual opinion of the game, don't worry, this is my favorite 3DS game. But I feel like if you really appreciate something, then you can also take a step back and be able to point out its flaws despite your positive feelings on the matter. But before I get into the review, when I said I was going to fully review Rune Factory 4, I meant it. I implore you to reconsider watching this video if you still haven't beaten the game, because I'm obviously going to be talking about a lot of story spoilers. But I will put a warning up before I start talking about anything. So now that we've got all that out of the way, let's get started. And what better way to get started than with the title theme song? Now when it comes to games, there's no right or wrong answer to the question, does a game need an opening theme song? Because honestly, there are some games where less is more, like Dark Souls where the opening is quiet and doesn't play music at all, which honestly matches the game's aesthetic. This game is all about the atmosphere and gameplay. It's dark, it's unforgiving, and it feels cold and hopeless. Not to mention that the only things you'll be hearing throughout the game is the sounds of enemies coming to destroy your happiness. Well, that and the you died sound effect. you'll be hearing that one a lot. On the contrary, there are games that have absolutely awesome opening theme songs like Persona 5. Freaking fantastic game by the way if you haven't already played it. And there's also the theme to Dragon's Dogma. No, not that one. This one. Yes, I also find it weird that the original theme of the game was kinda J-poppy, but gosh dang if it isn't catchy and hypes me to play the game every single time I start it up. However, there is one thing I will tell you about myself. If I find the opening to a game to be really catchy, it has me. And it's usually an awesome game. And Rune Factory 4's opening is super catchy. Honestly, the first time I started the game and listened to the theme song, I restarted the game and listened to it a couple more times because of how much I liked it. And thankfully, the catchy theme song didn't let me down because I was absorbed into the game within the first couple of hours. At least until I came across a hurdle which required me to do a bunch of research, which in turn inspired me to make a tutorial, and the rest is history. But I'll get into the details of that a little bit later. For now, let's talk about the story. Oh, and if you didn't realize it, this is the spoiler section. Skip to this time if you don't want to hear any story spoilers. Now that I've got the warnings out of the way, let us continue into the story of Rune Factory 4! Our story begins in the skies of Selfia as our protagonist is on his way to deliver a gift to the god of Selfia. While he is muttering to himself, he is ambushed by two unknown soldiers who are attempting to steal the gift in his possession. After winning the brief altercation, he turns around like a dingus without finishing them off and continues muttering to himself and staring at the stone. And as you would expect, since he didn't actually finish those two soldiers off, you can guess what happens next. <coughs> After waking up in a daze from the knock in the head, we find that we can no longer remember anything, much to the dismay of the soldiers who wanted to steal the stone for themselves. They seem pretty mad, but surely they wouldn't do anything rash out of frustration, would they? We then cut to a dragon who's lost in thought when suddenly... Our main character drops in to say hi. Literally. After talking with the dragon, we find out three things. The first is that the altercation with the soldiers left our character with a case of amnesia. However, we are able to remember our name. The second is that she is essentially putting on an act to portray herself as a proper god to keep the villagers of this town unaware of her actual personality. 
For what reason she does this is still a mystery to us at this point. The final thing we learn is that we are what's known as an Earthmate. Earthmates are beings who can communicate with both the Earth and monsters. What does that mean? Well, we'll find out a little bit later. After living in a town for a bit, we decide to take a leisurely stroll in the woods. While exploring the woods, we come across this giant, freaky butterfly creature. After we finish beating the bejesus out of it, the butterfly turns into a girl. So naturally, we decide to take her to the town clinic because while I'm down to beat up female butterfly creatures, I'm not down to beat up human girls that have butterfly features. Because I'm classy like that. That in the game wouldn't let me. After making sure she was taken care of, we decide to tell Ventus well about what has transpired in the forest. While she does have a shocked reaction, it doesn't seem like she was surprised because of what happened in the forest, it seemed like she was more surprised about the girl. Almost as if she knew who she was, or something like that. But whatever the case is, she isn't talking about it. Cut to a few days later and the villagers are complaining about noises outside of town. Ventus will calms the villagers by explaining that she thinks she knows what's going on and like the benevolent guardian that she is, says that she will personally take care of it. And just as soon as the villagers leave, she immediately dumps the task onto us because she has better things to do, like sitting. So a hop skip and a jump later, we wind up at the source of the noise, and no sooner than after you arrive, you are almost immediately taken out by a goblin who sneaks up behind you, but you are saved by Doug. Man, we really have a problem with not paying attention and getting snuck up on. Anyway, why is Doug here? He just gives us the fireball spell and basically says, Hey idiot, stop letting things sneak up on you or you'll die. And to be quite frank, I wholeheartedly agree with him. So after our scolding from Doug, we eventually make our way to the heart of the matter, which turns out to be the spawn of Satan. I mean this horse. After giving this horse a thorough thrashing, and I do mean thorough, like the horse stood absolutely no chance against me and I totally didn't need the help of other monsters just so I didn't die in the first couple of seconds, and I especially didn't die over 12 times and cried into my pillow at night. Anyway, long story short, this creature also turned into a person, and again, despite my best efforts, the game wouldn't let me beat him up. Not for a lack of trying, mind you. So, much like last time, we decide to take this person to the clinic. We tell Ventus well, and she acts weird about it. Only this time, she seems a bit off. Like, us attacking these monsters is messing with her in some kind of way. But we don't have time to think about that because BAM! Little Ghost Girl! And she's saying some odd stuff. Like she has been waiting for this day forever, not to mention that she knew that we already saved two people recently and assumed that Ven told us. Which, boy oh boy, I wonder who that could be. Anywho, she tells us to go to the Obsidian Mansion to help her save Dolly. And because I honest to god have nothing better to do with my life, I decide to head over to the Haunted Mansion to help her. But not before forcing Margaret and Forte to come with me because I know they are deathly afraid of ghosts and I am one messed up sadistic individual. By this point, everything that happens next is routine. Go to weird place? Check! Fight big monster? Check! Big monster turns into person? Check! Person is unconscious after transforming? Check! Wait a minute! Not check! Hey, maybe I can get some answers now! Check. But unlike every other time, instead of taking the person to the clinic, Pika whisks Dolly away to take her to Ven's place. So we follow her and overhear something shocking. Ventus Will is dying. Apparently, the monster people we have been defeating and taking to the village were what's known as Guardians, and the Guardians had been replenishing the land's source of magic, which is known as runes. And unfortunately, since we had been defeating the monsters, restoring the Guardians' original forms, and taking them away from where we had found them, the land's runes have gone back to declining. Which means that Ventus Will's life is coming to an end because she is essentially connected to the ecosystem in a cycle of life and death. When her kind's time is nearing its end, they expel the last of their own rune power to enrich the land which allows just enough time for another dragon to be born to take the previous dragon's place. But this didn't sit well with the people who had befriended her, and they decided that they didn't want to see her die. So they ultimately ended up sacrificing themselves in order to buy her and the kingdom more time to come up with a solution to stop the cycle from becoming necessary. 
but unfortunately, with each passing generation and with each friend making the ultimate sacrifice, it was becoming abundantly clear that there was no way to end the cycle. Which leads us to the present day, where she, after meeting you, decided to free her friends from being the catalyst for more rune power and finally let her life end by completing her purpose and enriching the land. But much like each friend she has made in the previous generations, we offer to become the next guardian so she can live. To which she adamantly refuses, explaining that she is tired of losing her friends just so she can live a little longer, and explains that living on at the cost of her friends' lives is a very painful existence. After which she begs us to release the last guardian, her very first friend, so that she can die with no regrets. Immediately after leaving the room, we come across Doug, who seems to have overheard what's going on, but rather than sympathizing with our character wanting to save her, he seems to want us to hurry up and save the last guardian so that she will die. Rather than worrying about what Doug's beef with Ventus will is, we go to our room and try to figure out if there's something we can do to save her. When all of a sudden, BAM! Little Girl Squirrel! <laughs> who attacks us, then steals Ventus Will's charm that she gave us. The squirrel then leads us on a wild goose chase which starts in a cave and ends with a tree, as chasing a squirrel usually does. But along the way, we come across the glowing orb that we had in the very beginning of the game before we got bonked on the head. After defeating the tree, the squirrel hits us one more time and causes us to drop the glowing orb onto the ground, which then explodes with rune power. Apparently, the ghost squirrel is a voice from beyond stating that they are all watching over Ventus Will, which is... kinda weird. But regardless of that, we seem to have a way to keep both Ventus Will alive and free the Guardians. But shortly after placing the mysterious orb, Doug shows up and isn't pleased at all. He also seems to know exactly what this orb is, but isn't elaborating on it. Instead, he then proceeds to drop a bombshell on us, stating that Ventus Will killed his father and his entire tribe. After a bit of arguing, he then declares war on us, stating that he will get the other rune spears before we do. But ultimately, we're the ones that get them all first, all of them except for the last one, which happens to be in Doug's possession. After getting the third one, Pico... Oh, uh, <clears throat> sorry. Little Ghost Girl! <laughs> ...tells us that Ventus Will has regained consciousness. Once we make our way over there, we come across Doug getting ready to straight up shank a dragon. Which, either Doug is so incredibly strong that he thinks he can fully take on a divine dragon, or he's an idiot. And given his reputation, I'm going to assume that he's an idiot. After some talking, we find out that 1. Ventus Will is unable to leave Celthia because she is tethered to it, and two, the ones who told Doug that Ventus Will was responsible for killing his tribe was none other than the Sex Territory. Yeah, alright. With that revelation, Doug gives us the final rune spear and we make our way to Leon Karnak, only to find out that the way is actually blocked. But not to worry, through a series of coincidences, we happen to meet a man who thinks he has a way to save the last guardian without having to go to Leon Karnak at all. It didn't work. Okay, plan B. We blow up an orb, go to a different dimension, and then grab the Guardian and whiff back into reality using a magic ring we just got from a man we just met. Seems smart. Well, after a long series of events and listening to the Guardian's last conversations before being sealed, we finally reach Leon, the final Guardian. Or rather, we are attempting to reach him, but something is pulling us back. So, much like every other Guardian, we decide to make the ultimate sacrifice and chuck the ring at him so he can be freed, while we spend an eternity in this white abyss. And that's it. As the credits roll, we sit and wait in this different dimension hoping that someday we can return to our friends. Just kidding! Ventus Will doesn't give a crap about the rules of this world! So in the end, everything worked out. Ventus Will is alive and the Guardians are free. I guess everything's going to be alright now. Or so you would think. See, this game operates in story arcs instead of a continual story throughout the whole game. And what we just completed was the first arc. And guess how long it takes for the second arc to start and for everyone's days to be ruined? Just a couple of days! Hooray! Thankfully, this arc is pretty straightforward, so not many story elements happen in this segment. Just a couple of days after we spent nearly a lifetime in an endless void of white, life is good. Ventus Willis regained her strength and she's able to joke around with us again. Did it hurt? Did what hurt? When you fell from heaven? Of course it did! I fell from thousands of feet in the air and only had a big scaly dragon and a hard stone floor to break my fall! 
freaking moron. After restoring the memory of her friends and clearing the air with them, the village is attacked by the Sex Empire. Who came up with that name? During the attack, Doug is injured trying to protect Blossom. After which we find out that Doug was a spy for the Sex Empire, which is why he had knowledge about the Rune Spears in the first place. Not only that, but the soldier reveals that it wasn't Ventuswell that killed Doug's tribe, it was actually the Sex Empire that slaughtered his tribe. Okay, seriously, I'm starting to get uncomfortable with how much I'm having to say sex in the span of a few seconds. We also find out that the Empire has taken all of the Rune Spears from their resting places. After we finish fighting the soldier, we talk to Ventuswill, who has collapsed as to be expected. And honestly, most of what happens next is a lot of talking, so I will sum it up for you. Ventuswill has collapsed, so we say we will save her. While visiting Doug in the clinic, Arthur, the actual prince of the kingdom, tells us not to go after the Empire because this is now a political affair since one kingdom has invaded another. But we convince him to let us go anyway. After leaving, we end up in a secret hidden lab inside a cave where we save this adorable little fairy who I promise to take with me as soon as I can. I never came back for her. Once we reach the end of the cave, we finally meet the ruler of the Sex Empire, Ethelbert. While he's rambling to himself, we find out that he seems to want the powers of an Earthmate and needs the Rune Spears in order to do so. Afterwards, he straight up dips and leaves us to fight the Divine Dragon Terrible. Well, kinda. It's a clone of Terrible. Uh-oh. This isn't good. No. It's Terrible. I'm sorry. After we defeat it, we once again run into Arthur, and long story short, he asks us to continue the chase. At this point, things become very simple. We follow Ethelbert all the way into his kingdom and destroy his dragon clones along the way. Eventually, we catch up to him and he demonstrates for us how these clones are actually made. It appears that all he needs in order to make one of the dragon clones is to use the rune spear along with a vessel and a piece of the divine dragon. He then fuses them together with Earthmate magic. After we defeat his new creation, he is about to escape when Doug comes in at the last minute to kick some- Uh, Wow. Doug really sucks hard. But hey, at least he got a rune sphere before getting completely demolished by Ethelbird. Once we take Doug to the town clinic, the village is attacked yet again by Ethelbird in order to challenge us, and we have no choice but to answer his challenge in order to save the town. After traversing through the floating empire and battling all sorts of monsters and mechs, we finally face off against the Emperor, who finally tells us what he's actually after. See, he doesn't want the power of the runemates. He wants to be a runemate. In his eyes, they are the closest things to God since they wield so much power which in essence is what he wants to be, a god. After a quick altercation with the Emperor, he then turns to using the Rune Spheres on himself, which gives him insane power. But fortunately, Ventus will Arthur, and unfortunately, Doug, come in the nick of time to help us. After we defeat Ethelbert, he begins to fade from existence. Ventus will explains that the human body is not capable of using that much rune energy, and as a result of Ethelbert abusing the rune sphere on himself, made his body start to deteriorate. To which he responds that he knew as much, but intends to leave his body for a proper vessel. And if you remember his explanation of how he made dragons, all he needs is a vessel, a piece of a divine dragon, and a rune sphere. He then proceeds to cast a fusion magic and absorb Ventuswill into himself. Once fused, Ventuswill is only able to take control just long enough for her to beg us to kill them both. When Ethelbert takes control once more, it's become quite clear that he's gone off the deep end, but not enough for him to forget the suffering an Earthmate caused him by defeating him earlier in his life. And since that Earthmate isn't around, he's gonna make you suffer instead. Oh well, goodbye Doug and Arthur, it was nice knowing you. Well, one of you. So this fight goes... about as well as you'd expect it. As in, we get creamed, destroyed, obliterated, diddled, if you will. But just as all hope is lost, you hear a voice. It turns out that the entire village has gone to the four areas where the rune spears once laid in order to send you power. Kinda like how the guardians gave Ventuswell rune power while they were sealed. With our newfound energy, we face off against Ethel Will for the final showdown. After a long and strenuous battle, we emerge victorious, and Ventus Will and Ethelbird are separated. 
and since Ethelbird no longer has a stronger vessel, his body is being pulled into another dimension. Our long journey is finally at an end, but unlike the last time, everything did not work out. Doug and Arthur surely died in that airship. Oh. Well, never mind then, I guess everything did work out after all. At least for a short while. You see, much like Ethelbird, Ventuswell's body was pulled into the other dimension immediately after destroying the fusion between the two. What we are actually seeing is her spirit sticking around just long enough for her to say goodbye to everybody. And, after a tearful goodbye, Ventuswell fades from existence. Thus ends Arc 2. Is there another arc, you ask? Technically, yes. However, unlike every other arc in this game, when this arc will begin is completely random, which I have a love-hate relationship with, but I digress. This arc also has little to no story elements other than the fact that we get to find out more about our main character and the events that led up to us having the Rune Spear in the beginning of the game. How does the story of this arc start? A year after Ventuswell has died, we find out that the other Guardians are sneaking around and plotting something. After talking with them, it seems that there may very well be a way to save Ventuswell after all. Apparently, a door to the other dimension has appeared at Leon Karnak, and if we take the Rune Sphere and place it at the end of the dungeon, it should be strong enough to be able to bring Ventuswell back to this realm. Sounds easy, right? <laughs> no, no, it's not. You see, much like Dante's Seven Levels of Hell, the dungeon we are about to traverse has seven floors, and each one is designed to make you cry out of frustration in a numerous amount of ways. If you think you've prepared enough for one floor, you can expect to be thoroughly diddled in the next one. But through hours of pushing, crying, and being diddled, we make our way through the unforgiving dimension. As we keep clearing the floors of this dungeon, we hear a voice speak to us and tell us many things about the past. The first thing the voice mentions is that Ventuswell's spirit is still alive and that she is continually supporting the land of Selfia from this plane of existence. The next thing the voice tells us is that the divine dragons normally live for a very long time and age slowly. However, by the time Ventuswell was born, the land's runes were already beginning to die, which made Ventuswell very weak and her lifespan extremely short. As such, the people pitied her and tried to help her as much as possible, which led to the creation of the spell Aetherlink. While explaining this, we also find out that the voice speaking to us appears to be an Earthmate from a previous generation. After going a little bit further into the dungeon, we find out that the Earthmates had been researching ways to permanently prolong Ventuswell's life, which led to the creation of the Rune Spear. The idea was to use Aetherlink on the Rune Spear to fuse it to Ventuswell's spirit, which would give her an immense amount of rune power, thus allowing her to live out what would have been her normal lifespan. Once we reach the final room of the final floor, we come across a familiar face, the malefic non-human version of Ethelbird, Ragnarok. It would appear that Ethelbird finally got what he was after. He's no longer human after all. After defeating Ragnarok, we enter the final room which is a familiar white void, which contains Ventuswell's spirit. At first she refuses to come back, stating that our body wouldn't be able to handle the process of etherlinking her spirit. But we're not alone anymore, are we? We have everybody at the village as well as the previous generations of Earthmates supporting us. And so we cast a spell and the room goes silent. Fearing we have failed, we make our way back home only to be pleasantly surprised that Ventuswell is alive and well. She wishes to talk and to joke around with us for the rest of our days, and that's where the story ends. So all in all, I do like the story. There are some parts here and there that I felt could have been better, such as, well, arc three in general. See, I'm just going to go over all of the issues that I have with this arc. My first and biggest complaint is something that I haven't even mentioned in this video yet. In order to access Arc 3, you need to trigger a specific event. However, when this event will occur is completely random. Now, don't get me wrong, I get it. The event showing up at a random time is a cool way to surprise people with the fact that the story isn't quite over yet. However, it is extremely frustrating that the event is random for two reasons. The first and biggest problem is that because it is random, this means that the event could take a very long time to appear. I think the longest I have ever had to wait was a little over a year in the game, and by that point, most people would have probably finished all that they wanted to with the game and may have stopped playing it before even unlocking the event. The second problem I have with it is that if you're replaying the game, getting this event to appear can be a chore. Yes, I know there is an exploit you can abuse by befriending Dillis and Amber and having them in your party as you go to sleep. 
but the fact that I would have to do this just to be able to finish the story is completely unreasonable. To be perfectly honest, it should have just been a timed event. Something that takes place a certain amount of days after completing the initial story arc. That's what they did to start Arc 2, and I don't see why they couldn't do it for Arc 3 as well. Now, I'm going to talk about something that people may agree with me on, and that some might disagree. I honestly think that they missed out on an opportunity with the final boss of Arc 3. See, what I was expecting coming into this area and seeing what Ethelbert had become was Lest, our main character, commenting on seeing him as a monster, but I also thought that it would have been cool if Ethelbert had some form of dialogue that appeared as soon as you see him. Either him muttering something incoherent from completely losing his mind, or maybe he's actually in control of his mind and realizes that Lest is trying to revive Ventuswell using Etherlink. So he challenges Lest to one final duel, if he wins he will use the Rune Spear to return to Selfia. But above all, I just wanted something out of this altercation. I feel like having nothing there is just a waste of a good opportunity. And finally, I think that the ending of this arc is a little bit weak. I'm not referring to the talk that you have with Ventuswell in the Void, I'm referring to what happens afterwards. With Ventuswell being dead for over a year, you would think that her returning to life would cause the village to erupt in celebration, but the only thing you get is people commenting on it if you actually go up and talk to them. To be perfectly honest, I feel like it should have ended kinda like Arc 2 ended, only with everyone being in Ventuswell's chamber celebrating her reincarnation with everyone around her. Then after the party, you and Ventuswell have a heartfelt conversation. I would have much preferred this to the, oh, good job, I'm alive again, that we actually end up getting. My only other problem with the story is that I felt like Arc 2 was a bit short. This arc introduces a villain, but he's barely seen and is only around for like an hour or two before the story is even finished. Even then, we only face off against him one time. I do realize he was a villain in a previous Rune Factory game, but Rune Factory 4 was the very first Rune Factory game that I have ever played, and it may have been the same for other people, so I feel like this game should have given us a little bit more time to take him in as the person we must defeat at all cost. But I don't know, maybe that's just me. Anyway, now that I've gone over my issues with the story, let's move on to the problems I had with the game overall, and we might as well start with one problem that I have made very relevant on this channel, Doug. For a while I have made it clear that my relationship with Doug is... He does nothing and he's still better than Doug! She is almost as bad as Doug. He's complete and total garbage. Not the greatest. But I haven't exactly talked about why I dislike him so much. I like Doug's story. He's a misguided dwarf who was out for revenge after the murder of his clan, but was fooled into thinking that someone else killed his entire tribe by the people who were actually responsible for the deaths of his people. It's a decent setup for his character and also explains why he is both decent at combat, as far as the story is concerned, and why he seems to have a hatred for Ventus Will. With how relevant Doug is to the story and how much combat he's in, you would think that when you are actually able to bring him with you on adventures that he would be decently strong and be able to handle himself well in combat. But he doesn't. Actually, not only is he bad, he is awful compared to the other villagers you can have with you at the time. And that is what infuriates me about Doug. He is weak, and it doesn't make any sense given his background. Doug is the one who saves you from a monster in the water ruins and gives you a spell because he knows that some monsters are highly resistant to physical attacks. He survived a point-blank spell from Ethelbird, as well as a barrage of wind magic from the fusion between Ethelbird and Ventuswell. Ever since his clan died, he has been on the path of revenge, so you would think that he would have spent a fair amount of time making himself stronger to be able to achieve it. And to top it all off, when you are finally able to bring him with you to places, he is a low level and is only capable of learning a few skills that aren't very good compared to some of the moves the other villagers have. So I guess in actuality, it isn't Doug that I personally have a problem with, it's how little the designers seem to care about his combat kit even though they made him a huge part of this story. And on the note of caring little about the signs of combat kits, there are a lot of villagers that are just... the worst. But I've already extensively talked about those people, but what I haven't talked about is why it bothers me and what I think they could have done differently. One feature that I really enjoy about this game is that while progressing through the story, if you have a villager with you, they may have additional dialogue to add to a cutscene. Case in point, I had Dillis with me after the attack on the village in the beginning of the second arc, which is when you need to go see Doug in the town clinic. The relationship between Doug and Dillis may appear like they don't like each other, but it's more like a rivalry. 
And in the scene involving Doug, if you have Dillis with you, Blossom says that it's sweet of Dillis to come and visit Doug, to which he responds that he only wanted to see Doug's swollen face, but shows that he was actually concerned about what happened to Doug, saying that he had looked better than he thought. And it's not just serious scenes that this can happen with. Take, for example, bringing Dolce with you when you start heading towards the Empire of questionable names. When you get ready to fight some of the Empire's lackeys, you get this wacky Pokemon reference between Dolce and Pico. That, to me, is very cool. See, part of the fun I had with this game was getting to know the villagers and their personalities, then taking my favorite ones with me on my adventures. But then I found out that depending on who you have with you when you are completing the story, they may actually have additional dialogue to add to certain scenes, and that made me enjoy it even more. But as I got further into the game and areas became harder to get through, it was frustrating that some of my favorite villagers just weren't good enough to take with me because they weren't doing enough in combat. And I feel like that is kind of a big problem when you set up the scenario of having the ability to take your favorite people with you, only to find out that they aren't up to snuff. That can turn a lot of people off of using villagers as companions altogether, which is a shame because there's a lot of dialogue that I bet people still haven't found in this game because you needed to have a certain person with you at a certain time. Now, I've been around the ballpark a few times when it comes to this kind of thing. If you have too little companions to choose from, then things can get kind of bland just using the same team over and over again unless they have a lot of character development. On the other hand, if you have too many people to choose from, case in point Chrono Cross, a fantastic game which I will be going over in the near future on this channel, then you have this problem of certain people clearly being better than the others, which makes you have to choose between using the people who are good or using the people that you like. Rune Factory 4, for lack of a better word, has Chrono Cross Syndrome, because as much as I love Bado shenanigans, he is an absolute garbage can. So then the question would be, what could you do to fix this? Simple, you give each villager their own role and make it unique without making them useless. It sounds much more complicated than it actually is, so let me give you an example of what I mean. Let's take Dolce for example. She is essentially a dark mage, uses dark magic, can throw cards kind of like a magician, and has a ghost companion that she can summon at will. This is what a good and unique role should be. Nobody else in the village uses as much dark magic as she does, and she even has a couple of unique attacks. Another good example would be Lympha. She has some really good spear techniques, but can also throw shurikens and make pans fall from the sky. Now that you have a good idea of what I'm talking about, let's talk about a trash can villager and see what we could do to make them better. This is Margaret. She can actually be a really good support if you're dating her because she will learn the best healing spell in the game, but as I've said, only if you're dating her. If you aren't dating her, she isn't that great. So let's see what we can do. She already has these note attacks which are unique to her, so let's work around that. What I would do to make her unique and useful would be to make her more of an offensive support than she already is by altering some of her techniques. While the notes really fit her character, I don't think all of her spells should be note attacks. I think her primary attack should be the notes, then her status ailment move should be an area of effect spell kind of like how Rainbow Heal is, but it would inflict a random status ailment. Then finally, I would give her two area of effect spells. One would buff the party's defense and the other would buff the party's attack. This essentially makes her more of a consistent battle bar that will always be useful. Not to mention that this makes her even more unique than she already was. But I know what you're thinking. She was already unique, so it was easy to think of ways to make her better. And to that I say you are absolutely right. So now I will talk about another trash can, Arthur. So I guess what they were going for with Arthur based upon how his combat AI behaves is that they wanted him to be a mage who would use the prism spell, then run up and melee enemies. So why don't we take it a step further and make him a close quarters mage? Prism is good, we don't need to change that, but let's give him the darkness spell so that after he activates prism and runs up to an enemy, he can cast darkness, which activates wherever you're standing. These two spells would obliterate almost any enemy because they fuse very well together and the damage would stack, essentially stun locking whatever monster came into contact with Arthur. He would also need some kind of spell or technique that would either bolster his defense or make him immune to knockback like Steel Heart. And that's all you'd have to do to him. There are no other close range mages in the village and that kit in particular would make him very useful in crowds of large enemies. If every villager was useful in their own way and was uniquely designed to fit a specific role, then I would have absolutely no complaints about the game. Well, other than the last subject I want to talk about. I feel like the tutorials of this game can be really overbearing. And I mean really overbearing. 
I don't know if anybody else picked up on this, but essentially the entire first arc was just one really long tutorial. Especially so in the beginning, but let's be real here, the entirety of it was a tutorial. Some of it was really well done, such as when you meet Green the Fairy. You save her, then she asks to go with you. If you haven't built a monster barn by this point, then this is a great and subtle way to show you that you can have monsters as companions. Or the villager request showing you things that you might not have known you could do without the game shoving the information down your throat. Unfortunately, that's about where the decent tutorials end. First of all, before I get into this, if you are playing the game for a second time, then you can skip both the farming and room tutorials. That's nice. But every other tutorial, you have to painstakingly sit through. The first one to two hours of the game is a continuous tutorial, and even after you get through it, the game doesn't give you any real freedom until near the end of the first arc. Getting me started is one thing, but I want to be able to run around and do what I want to do without being forced into the main story plot. Speaking of tutorials, this game can be very cryptic about a lot of its features, such as what you need to feed monsters in order to give it permanent stat boost, or certain areas only being available on certain days. But I think the worst offender of this would have to be most of the tricks you can learn in the forging and crafting system. The main ones are the max level overriding and rarity systems, but I won't go into detail on what they all do exactly. But what I will say is that they really should have been introduced as a villager request. Villager requests are used to show us how to do so many different things in the game, so why not at the very least use it to introduce us to each of the systems instead of making us learn how to do it from the comments of a no-name NPC that shows up randomly. Despite all of the flaws I just mentioned, this game is very lighthearted and an overall fun experience. It's also a very easy game to dive into, and if you really don't feel like fighting monsters or progressing through the story, then you could just as easily spend your time farming. Despite how much of a hassle some of the villagers can be to take with you, they all have their own charming personalities that are fun to uncover. And if you feel like going out into the world solo like I did on my first playthrough, then you will be happy to know that the game has just the right amount of difficulty to make things challenging, but not so much so as to make it feel unfair. Every time I died in this game, I knew that I could have done something different to survive or that I could go back and make some better gear if I wanted to progress. The random events in this game may seem annoying to most people, but I actually like them for the most part because it keeps the game fresh. Even when I replayed this game for footage, I ended up getting a couple of events to happen that I have never seen before. If you haven't played this game before, then I highly recommend giving it a chance. I don't think you will be disappointed. Thank you so much for watching everybody, but now I must crawl back into the hole from whence I came until the next video is complete. So as always, until next time, see you later. Hey everyone, Johnny Boy here, and I know Johnny Boy here. I'm put Johnny Boy here. Click to this time. Close, but no Sigour! Sigour! Sigal. Steven Sigour. Click to the. Click to the cup pa! Cha pa! Oh! I have a lot of fun. I have a lot of fun.